Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett, and we're a proud member of the Dialogue Podcast Network, a collective of independent, interesting podcasts who promote thoughtful, respectful, and engaging inquiry and discussion of all aspects of the LDS tradition, thought, arts, and culture. Find out more at dialoguejournal.com slash podcast network. That's all one word, dialoguejournal.com slash podcast network. What are some of the differences between LDS theology and fundamentalist theology? We're going to find out with Lindsay Hansen Park. We'll find out how many wives, for example, it takes for a fundamentalist to get into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. It's more than I thought. I didn't even know there were rules to that, so that's going to be very interesting. You won't want to miss our conversation. Check it out. The interesting thing about this that you need to know is you're familiar with the second anointing. I'm assuming you're listeners are. Uh, I, well, I mean, without treading too delicately, because I know this is a very sensitive topic, can you, can you just give us a little bit of information mm-hmm. on that? All you need to know about the second anointing is that when you are anointed in the temple, it's considered the first anointing. Basically, you're anointed with the potential to become a god someday. Second anointing is a special ordinance given to select few. It was a lot more common back in the day. Are you still getting me? Um, it was a lot more common back in the day and what it does is it doesn't just promise you that you're going to be a god someday it assures you as a god it, it, the, the language is your calling and election is made sure so you're promised that you're a god so basically short of murder and denying the Holy Ghost you're good it doesn't matter what you do you're forgiven you're good to go the reason why I bring this up is as far as I am able to track, and if anyone out there is listening can can correct me on this, I haven't been able to find um, something to dispute this so far. All of the founding fathers of Mormon fundamentalism were LDS people who had their second anointing. So even if they were excommunicated from the LDS church for practicing plural marriage, theoretically, it doesn't matter. Their calling and elections made sure, which is a really interesting idea, especially when you have to is this similar to the protestant idea of where you know if you want to be saved all you got to do is say this special prayer i mean i remember on my mission i had a a preacher that we came to his door and he's like would you like to be saved i can save you right now on the spot you just have to say this prayer and you'll be saved and i mean it's there are a lot of evangelicals that believe in this in this saved idea. Is it, is it similar? No. no? And, and here's here's why. Because Mormonism is completely a works doctrine. We have grace. Like, what you're talking about is grace. We're talking about grace, the grace of God, the uh, salvation be extended to everyone. Mormonism believes that uh, in theory, but absolutely not in practice. Salvation is only given to those who work for it, right? You have to have certain levels. You have to go through the temple. You have to be married. To get into the saving part of Mormon heaven, right, the highest degree of Mormon heaven, you have to have certain ordinances. So the reason why this is different is because it's only given to a select few, and they're men, and they're promised worlds without end. And I, I think LDS people don't understand this. They think, in, in theory, they're being promised the same thing. But this is different. It's still given, you know, we know Hans Matzen received his second anointing. We know that Tom Phillips, there's a few LDS people that have come to me privately, you know, uh, children of apostles and, and things like that who've gone through and had the second anointing. But at the time, it was more common. There was a, you, you have to understand that Mormonism functioned as a secret brotherhood. It was very patriarchal. But you had mo- the state and the church were the same thing. So your militias, your government, your courts were all run by the bishops and the stake presidents and things like that. And so the stake president would reward men in the community by letting them, you know, recommending them to get their second anointing. But um, it was only given to the, the elite for sure. And so John W. Woolley. But, so how is that different than the evangelical idea of being saved? Because, I mean, I, I know, I mean, certainly there's a difference in, in the Godhead and the Trinity and things like that. But in, in my mind, you know, the, it, it's a guarantee, the second anointing in LES is a guarantee that you're, you're going to heaven. And in the evangelical idea of being, of being saved, 
you're guaranteed ain't nothing you can do to stop this. In fact, I don't even think they say murder or, uh, or, yeah. or denying the Holy Ghost. It, it's, it's like your ticket, you know. You no, and grace is banks, such a beautiful safe. thing. This Here's why I think it's different, because Mormon second anointing, first of all, Mormon heaven is for everybody. Guess what, guys? You all get in. You all get into Mormon heaven. Kind of a universalist. Right? Everybody gets into a Mormon heaven, but there's a specific type of Mormon heaven, the highest level, because we actually have it stratified. So the highest level is for certain people. Now, you can go to LDS.org right now, and you can look at the theology. They say in the celestial kingdom, so we have three degrees of glory, right? Our, del- our telestial, ter- have terrestrial. We member listeners, so maybe they're, they're not familiar with this. So, yeah. Okay, so when you die in, in Mormonism, um, and I'm being kind of reductive, but in our co- cosmology, you die, and if you were never introduced to Mormonism, you go to what's called spirit prison, or uh, the it's a waiting room, a spiritual waiting room, right. where you are given the opportunity to be taught the gospel. If you accept it, then you move up. If you don't accept it, then you move to the lowest level, right? Like, everybody gets into the lowest level of heaven. There's a famous quote from Joseph Smith. It's sort of a folk doctrine that if... If you saw how beautiful the lowest level of heaven was, you'd kill yourself to get there because it's so amazing. So that's everyone gets in. That's not true. That's not true. Well, I mean, the source material on it is has been, like all things, reinterpreted over the course of time. <laughs> uh, but no, so you have you have this lower level that everyone gets into. It's great. That's where you are. You know. Okay, so let me make sure. So we've got we've got. So after we die, there's a. You either go to spirit prison or, or paradise, which is kind yeah. of a, a just kind of a holding area uh-huh. until the resurrection, as which and in which you're you can be resurrected into one of three kingdoms. Yes. Okay. And um, so those three kingdoms would be what we would call heaven. But but, yeah. So everyone gets into heaven. There is a hell in Mormonism. Some people say Mormonism doesn't have a hell. Well, we believe in Mormonism. This is complicated, and we're getting into the weeds. But like that that was already decided, so Satan and his evil spirits, like, already are there, so that's already decided. We already, everyone that's on this earth sort of escaped hell, basically. We call that outer darkness. Outer darkness. Outer darkness, um, you can still get there if you have your second anointing and you deny the Holy Ghost. If Jesus stood before you and you lied about it, there's there's some some ways you could still get there, but it's really only offered to men and white men. <laughs> so, if you're a person of color, or a woman, you're fine. You're gonna, you're fine. You're going to heaven no matter what. Yeah. So, I mean, some LDS people might disagree with that, but I, I think that I could back that up theologically. So, uh, so yeah. So you get in the the lower level. The medium level is for uh, people like me, right? People that like were married in the temple, but now they don't wear their garments. And um, which is totally fine. Great being there. Uh, it's it's gonna be so fine. You're no longer an active Mormon. Would you say that? Or, I, or do you, go, you go to church sometimes. I, I do sometimes, and I just I do Mormonism my own way. I'm very committed to to Mormonism, but I just think some of the the rules we have are so dumb, so dumb. And we can talk about that later. But then the top level is celestial kingdom. And that's where I was headed. I was headed there for a long time. But honestly, like, I, this is what I tell all my FLDS friends. I am not celestial material. Like, it's not for me. It's for you, which is great. You be there. I'll be your servant. Like, just let me help you out. It's not, not my place, not my people. Social kingdom is for the righteous. It's for the people who really are good rule followers. Not my thing. Um, I, I always say, you know, me and Leo, Leo DiCaprio will, like, be beaching it down in hell together it's fine <laughs> but it within mormon doctrine and still on lds.org so the top level is called the celestial kingdom to get the celestial kingdom you have to have gone through the temple you have to have a ceiling ordinance you have to there's certain things you have to do and and that's why i say we're a works doctrine mormons are very much about earning our way into heaven and nobody likes to say that but that is absolutely why people don't think we're christians i mean grace is such a this is why I think it's different. Well, you, I, I would I would caveat that because I think evangelicals and Catholics are very different. Mm-hmm. Now, Catholics don't think we're going to heaven, certainly, but I, evangelicals drive me crazy. I'll just I'll just say that. Well, I'll probably Mormons just drive them all my crazy back. Listeners right now. No, no, no. I it, I think evangelicals. What's hard is we know we know what they're about like we know that they don't respect us they don't yeah. think that we're saved but, but, but what i'm saying is the whole grace works things 
I, I don't want to call that Christian. I want to call that evangelical because you've got yeah. kind of your born again. That's fair. Thing. Yeah. But because Catholics, I would I would argue. I mean, that was the whole difference between Luther and and Catholicism was this whole idea about grace and works. Yeah. And I don't I want I don't want to turn this into a grace and works because well, to me it's two sides of the same. Coin. And Mormonism is very Calvinist, and we I mean, but. Let's just say this. You have to, for you to get in the highest degrees of things, it is like a special order. There's, there's secret tokens, handshakes, signs, wording, behaviors, things like that. And so within the celestial kingdom are three degrees. You can go to LDS.org, look it up. It's still on our site. Now, in the old frontier doctrine, when this was really discussed and believed, it was widely believed and preached that the highest was for the polygamous families. And then you sort of went down from there. Now, in fundamental circles, I would say it's a sacred doctrine that's not it's sort of taboo to talk about still. But they believe in the celestial kingdom it's, is only for polygamists. And you, to get in the top level, you have to have seven wives, five in the middle, three in the bottom. I just want to interrupt here for a second because for those of you who are not familiar with, with LDS theology, so we, we talked about the spirit prison and the, and the paradise kind of a holding cell. Then we have three degrees of heaven. We've got the Telestial Kingdom, which is the bottom. The, ter- the So the bottom is going to include murderers and really bad people. But, but more... Yeah, but like decent people too. But yeah, some yeah. decent people. Like movie stars and rock stars. Ter- so this is all in section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants if you really want to get into it. Yeah. But uh, So the bottom is the Telestial Kingdom. The We, we refer to that as the... Um, kind of like the stars in the heaven. Mm-hmm. And you've got the glory of the moon, which is the terrestrial kingdom. Which is where I think I'm going. Where, okay, where Lindsay says she's going. Mm-hmm. And so those are good people who didn't quite do everything correctly. Certainly they're not murderers or anything like that. Yeah. But they're really good people. They watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay. Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then you've got the celestial kingdom. Yeah. Which is where all the good people go. It's and like that, in my mind it's all like everyone's go. white and quiet and like there's an old lady knitting really softly in the corner. Like everyone's just nice and quiet and streets are paved with gold and you all have kingdoms and thrones and principalities and but And and so really quickly, so We've got those three kingdoms, but within the celestial kingdom, you've also got three divisions with that. Yes. And that that's where you've been. That's what I'm talking about, because to understand this, the function of the second anointing. So when an LDS person goes to the temple, I don't know if you've been, but I've been anointed with this first anointing. We are promised the potential to become gods. And how this would be understood in this particular context is to become I have the potential to become a god. So I have the potential. I was promised potential to be at the top level, right? Um, but celestial kingdom, or the second anointing, puts you at the top level. You're done. You've yeah, made yeah. it. But it also, it, so you have to understand how we look at God. So second anointing actually, in my opinion, is inseparable from the Adam God doctrine, which is a fundamentalist doctrine that Brigham Young really sort of introduced. It has roots in some things that, you, that Joseph Smith was talking about and, and wrestling with. But really it's the idea and this is super reductive, so my fundamentalist friends, please forgive me, but I'm just talking to an LDS audience. Basically, Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, God, Elohim, was also Adam, the first person in the Bible. Like in Genesis, you know, Adam and Eve, Adam is God. God is Adam. And he came to earth in his human form to populate the earth with his spirit children. And he brought Eve along, his wife, and she is the mother of this earth. Okay, so God's a polygamist because he's in the highest, highest degree. And so he has a wife for every world. And Eve is just the mother of this world. So Adam and Eve come here. They do all the things. They have babies. And that's how we are the descendants of God. It's kind of, there's some beautiful, you know, takeaways from this doctrine. But, um, so what you're being promised in the second anointing is that. That you're going to be a God that gets planets, right? That you get, you get a world and, and what I would be promised if I went through that ceremony is to be an Eve, right? Like that I get to be a creation, uh, a heavenly mother of this world. And that's kind of the basic gist of, of this doctrine. And so these men, you know, back to John Taylor, they were given that promise. that They are in the highest level. And the reason why that's so important is because from John Taylor 
1886 revelation until basically 1925, we have generations of men who are faithful, loyal Mormons, leadership, apostles in the church, even the church prophets and, and leaders who have all gotten their second anointing, who are polygamists, who either continue polygamy after the LDS church officially goes away from it, or they give it up. And some are excommunicated, like the Woolies, or you know Joseph Musser, or all these people that start fundamentalism, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Theologically, it doesn't matter that they've been excommunicated from the LDS church, because their calling and election is made sure. So that's another interesting sort of, I call it conspiracy theory, if you can call it that. I mean, the guys who started fundamentalism have their paperwork. They have their credentials. So the Woolley family is one of those. One of the big critiques about their story is they waited 20 years after um, 1886 to like sort of come forward with this revelation. So people criticize that as uh, you know, one of the reasons why it's not true. I actually think that there are good arguments for why it was kept secret. I mean, from 86 to 1925, now you're not just talking about political federal pressure, you're talking about church pressure too. So basically John Taylor, that happens, he's gonna fight polygamy till he dies, he does fight polygamy till he dies. And then you have the years where you have Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, and Joseph F. Smith. And these guys are all in this quorum together, all of them are, you know, polygamists. The last LDS prophet that, to practice polygamy was up in the 1950s. Heber J. Grant was the last polygamist. Now, by the time he was LDS church president, he was a monogamist. His plural wives had passed away. But you have to understand, that's we're not that far removed from polygamy. And we're talking about, polygamy is a system of generations and cultural generations. And so I did a podcast episode that was really popular where I traced all the current quorum of the 12 apostles to polygamy. Uh, were they grandchildren of polygamists, children of polygamists? Did they, sometimes they were prosecuting uh, polygamists in the quorum. You know, they all have a connection. All of them have been touched by this. With the the yeah, with the exception of Uchtdorf, um, because he's German. We didn't really mess around with that stuff <laughs> over there. <laughs> I mean, we did. That's a whole other story. But as far as I know, I can't, I can't trace him. But to be a leader in Mormonism, in the frontier of Mormonism, you had to be a polygamist. That was just standard. To be an apostle or a prophet, it was required. I mean, there was no monogamous until the early 1900s. And that's important too. And there's, there's some functions to that. But basically, 1886 happens. It's now 1890, Wilford Woodruff, the pressure is on. Um, he basically comes forward with this, we call it the manifesto, the first manifesto. It's printed in a lot of our scriptures where... Uh, wasn't this right after a Supreme Court decision in which the church lost? Is that right? So the Reed Smoot hearings are... Um, I mean, there's a whole... We could talk for hours on that. Well, the Reed Smoot hearings weren't until 1904, though, right? Right, but, but you have to understand. So they're tied in... There are several acts, federal acts, that the government started to do. The Edmunds-Tucker Act, there's... Um, so the federal government was coming in to try to crack down and stop polygamy. They were they at one point the Republican Party had had actually coupled polygamy with slavery. They called it the twin relics of barbarism, polygamy and slavery. And and the Republican Party actually used that platform of eradicating polygamy to gain power. And slavery, yes. And slavery. But that's what I'm saying, like we can't, we can't Which underestimate that. It's so weird that, that Mormons are so, are so tied to the Republican Party now because the Republican Party was public enemy number one. Of course. <laughs> in the 18. The federal 50s, government. Especially. I mean, when Brigham Young came here, they came to Mexico. It was Mexico. What, they were leaving the United States. They were going to start their own, their own kingdom, Deseret. He, you know, Brigham inv invented his own language, the Deseret alphabet. They had their own script and coin, which were actually used. I didn't realize this until, you know, researching Juanita Brooks, but they were using bishops, they called it bishop's script or bishop's coins up until the, like the turn of the century because it's kind of like a coal mining um, company store. You were paid in church credit and you could buy from church stores. And that's, you know, caused a whole lot of other kind of problems <laughs> for people. But that's, that was their intention. So the struggle with the federal government, government is super interesting. So there was a lot of political pressure. There were acts that came in. And then those, like, um, 
so some of the legislation that was passed didn't have enough teeth, so then they would they would uh, rewrite it, get it passed, and there would be more. And so, again, basically the gist is the federal government is close to seizing the assets of the church by the time Wilford Woodruff is in charge. Now, his his leadership, I think, should be investigated by historians more. I think it's undervalued because... Wilford Woodruff. Yes, because Wilford Woodruff, who is an LDS prophet, he is... Most fundamentalists do not recognize him as a prophet. They recognize John Taylor. They, some even like Joseph F. Smith, but they don't like Wilford Woodruff. And, they, uh, and, you know, there's some interesting theories, and I've never been, this is ironic because of what I do, but I don't really care about priesthood. <laughs> it was never for me. I was just like, that's something that they do. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Boys they're, they're always arguing about power and who's, who's authority, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. So you, you, you're not really part, you don't, you don't endorse, endorse, and ordain women. Uh, I support ordained women. I feel like priesthood is so messy historically that if women want it, there is a good argument for that historically. Like, it's just, the men have been bickering over this forever. I just, honestly, I just think Mormon priesthood is so messy. Nobody understands it. Everybody thinks they understand it. They don't understand it. It's open to various interpretations. And that's why we have so many, you know, fundamentalist authorities that I think you can make a case for. And so, basically what this means is you have... The idea is that Wilford Woodruff didn't have enough keys to be an actual prophet. So he was kind of a, this is the fundamentalist theory, he's kind of a dummy prophet, right? Like, we're going to call him prophet because he has to do this. But really, the actual keys are given to other men. And there's some precedent so for this. the keys left with John Taylor, then? Some people believe that, not left with, they were given to other people. And there's, there's Outside a, the pro prophetic line. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and that's not unusual. It, by the time, there was a time when plural marriages and sealings could only be performed by the prophet, but that just in practice got too complicated in, you know, the frontier of Utah where everyone was spread out. So, you know, people were given keys and authorities to perform sealings, um, plural sealings outside of that. And Like a bishop is that low or it had to be a uh, president so a mission president? It maybe? wasn't supposed to be bishop level. Okay, so it was supposed to be apostle level, but it didn't happen that way. There are stories of state pe presidents, bishops marrying, sealing people. So some bishops did seal some, people. Some bishops did seal people. Um, I would say from my research, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was rare, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. But mostly it was apostles. Mostly apostles were, and, and this is where we're going to get into trouble, because now you've essentially lost control of of what it means to have the ceiling power. Of the ceiling power. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lindsay Hansen Park. In our next conversation, we'll talk about the 1890 Manifesto. How did Mormons view that back in 1890? Was it lip service or was it binding? So 1890 Manifesto comes out. Most people don't pay attention to it. In fact, you know, I talk about this in the podcast, but there's some stories of folks in southern Utah who didn't even hear about it till a few years later, and they were just like, eh, you know, that's just... Yeah, we know what they're doing again. And it became a debate. Some people were like, wait, is this really a thing? Like, the church wouldn't do this because they, like, I lost my first wife because of this because she was opposed to it. And they told me that my sacrifice mattered. Like, what the heck? They would never do this. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.